Now, chapter 19 of The Pop Chronicles, Revolt of the Fat Angel, Part 3, and or The Acid Test, Part 3. It was late in 1966. Publicist Danny Fields turned up at a New York night spot to size up the talents of a new group from out of town. Still another bunch of those West Coast, you know, acid rockers vying for the big time. So I asked a few people, I asked some of the kids who hung out at the club where they were playing, what do you think of them? One chick had seen them and she said, they're a very sexy lead singer. It's the first thing I ever heard about them, it's the first opinion right, I ever heard about them. Uh, I said, do you have anything more to tell me? She said, uh, I don't know, they're a sexy lead singer. You know, I don't know what to say, I can't talk about music. I can tell you that. So I went down to Undine's to hear them and I walked in the door they were playing. You know, the day destroys the night. Night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide. Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side, yeah. We chased our pleasures here. Dug our treasures there. We can't still recall the time we cried. I walked across the room and the music just kept on registering, it just kept on knocking off like response words in my brain. Like, this is weird, this is compressed, this is evil, this is strong, like this is different. Sexy lead singer James Douglas Morrison and friends Ray Manzarek, Robbie Krieger, and John Densmore had taken their name from some lines by poet William Blake. Aldous Huxley quoted the same lines in a widely read journal detailing his experiences with hallucinogenic mescaline, the doors of perception. There are things that are known and things that are unknown. In between are... It's a very small little Cosa Nostra brotherhood. Ray Manzarek. Communistic group in the sense that it's a brotherhood and a, a communal organization. Not meaning communistic having anything to do with politics, but having to do with the word commune and being, uh, being a brotherhood. Robbie Krieger. And uh, if any one of us were to leave the group, you know, there would be no group left, you know. Learn to forget 
gotten together in Los Angeles in 1965 at the start of the rock renaissance. Jim and I went to the film school at UCLA. Where Manzarek and Morrison met occasionally and talked about their common interest in rock and roll. That's the only music that's ever really turned me on. <clears throat> that first burst of rock and roll about when it first came out about uh, when I was in junior high school. What's up? People like uh, Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard. That, that time. Yeah. Manzarek met drummer John Densmore and guitarist Robbie Krieger in his meditation class at one of the Maharishi's first centers. Densmore's musical thing was jazz. Mostly jazz, I'd say. A little less classical, but that's there too. Jazz drummers, that's my main influence. Oh, I can't name any specific person, I can say everything. I mean, you know, just everything. I don't think any one person really, I don't even think I could pin it down to one form of music. But the first music I really dug, I think, was uh, jug band stuff. I did like flamenco a little bit, a lot before that. Yeah, I guess flamenco really was the first introduction to music. There's really been no one major influence. I grew up on the south side of Chicago, so I listened to a lot of blues and a lot of jazz, but uh, Bach and Stravinsky have been great influences too, so I guess no one person. I've just liked so many different things. Put them all together, they spell... I was very knocked out. I was particularly knocked out by one song they did called Light My Fire. You know that it would be untrue. You know that I would be a liar. If I was to say to you, Girl, we couldn't get much higher. Come on, baby, light my fire. Come on, baby, light my fire. Night is set the night on fire. The time to hesitate is through. The time to wallow in the mire. Try now we can only lose. And our love become a funeral pyre. Come on, baby, light my fire. Come on, baby, light my fire. Try to set the night on fire.
they had just released Break On Through, which was the first thing one didn't really make it. Sometime after that, they started getting response from the disc jockeys on the West Coast. The Light My Fire was like far and away the most heavily requested cut on that album. And then they were persuaded to turn it into a single. They, in this case, were the decision makers at Electra Records, who soon had to hire Danny Fields to head off a media stampede for the doors. That is, Electra made Danny chief of its burgeoning press relations. It was nearing the summer of 1967, the summer of Monterey. The rest is history. And that was like a once in a generation song. That was like an anthem. It's like satisfaction. You know, some, some songs become that. <laughs> Pop Chronicles will continue in a moment. Before you slip into unconsciousness, I'd like to have another kiss, another flashing chest. Days are bright and filled with pain And clothes me in your gentle rain The time you ran was too insane We'll meet again, we'll meet again Thousand thrills of millions. 
October 1967, The Doors had two albums on the Billboard Top Ten. Their single hit, Robbie Krieger's Light My Fire, had passed the million-dollar sales mark. And Jim Morrison, 23-year-old black sheep of a Navy commander's family, had become the hottest sex symbol in American rock since Elvis. Leather-panted, grinding and writhing in a kind of stoned-out caricature of Presley's pelvic hijinks, and treading metaphoric ground that L had never even approached, Morrison was the all-American teen idol 60s style, a kind of combination super stud and acid guru. I've always been attracted to ideas about uh, revolt and disorder and chaos and uh, activity which appears to have no meaning. I like things, I like crowd phenomena. A lot of people massing together in one area. Uh, because when that happens, you don't know what's going to happen. You know? It increases uh, chance things. You know? It increases the possibility of uh, something unusual happening. I was talking to Jim and I said, and you are the lead singer. Yes, right. He said, well, don't really call me a singer. He said, I kind of shout the songs. I said, okay, why don't you want to be called a singer? He said, no, because that will, like, I don't want to be compared to people who are singing. I do something else. I tell them. I say them. And that was it was about as much as I got out of him. People are strange when you're a stranger. Faces look ugly when you're alone. Women seem wicked when you're unwanted. Streets are uneven when you're down. When you're strange, faces come out of the rain. When you're strange, no one remembers your name. When you stray, when you stray, when you're strange, people are strange. When you're a stranger, faces look ugly. When you're alone, women seem wicked. When you're unwanted, streets are uneven. When you're down. When you're strange, no one remembers your name. When you're strange, when you're strange, when you're strange. to the Pop Chronicles. Almost from the start, the speculations and rumors that grew up around the doors, puffed up by mass media, had taken on an epic quality. There were, for instance, all the stories about all the drugs they allegedly consumed during their attention-grabbing tenure at the Whiskey A Go-Go in 1966. Stories about how Morrison fell off the stage a lot. There was once a rumor that they were going to start wearing masks. I don't know where they picked up on that. Uh, someone asked me about it, and I said, they are wearing masks. And they're wearing masks right now. They're not real masks, but they're wearing masks because there's that element up there. There's some kind of starkness, and there's some kind of removal from like just being people up there. They are playing something out. Each of them is more than one person. Each of them is symbolic. 
the three of them were like pillars, you know, and like they were holding the roof up around Morrison as he performed. It was, you know, just classic. It was beautiful. And that was theater. It was ritual, and it was ceremony, which is theater. The killer awoke before dawn. He put his boots on. He took a face from the ancient gallery and he walked on down the hall. He went into the room where his sister lived and then he paid a visit to his brother and then he he walked on down the hall And he came to a door And he looked inside Father, yes son, I want to kill you Mother, I want to It's been rumored that the preceding number, Jim's own composition, uh, didn't go over very well with his old man. But the critics loved it. They called it things like Sophoclean and Joycean. I don't know why. Uh... If you could pin it down to that, I don't know. Uh, I'd say they're more. Our album is much more uh, influenced by uh, um, some of the older uh, writers, you know, like especially the end. It's very close to the uh, to some of the things Shakespeare did, Sophocles, or even old Egyptian writers. You know, uh, like I, I wouldn't say that the whole album is Sophocles. <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. I, I'd say that the the end is a little bit like Joyce, but. Uh, not really. I think the is definitely one of the phenomena of groups now. They've certainly got the most incredible publicity. They were analyzed at all levels. They were accepted at all these levels. They were intriguing at all these levels. They've obviously made a statement that's attracted some attention, at least stopped a good number of people in their tracks, because a lot of people have wanted to talk about them. People really just, they threw it in. When it came to writing about the doors, they freaked out. Satanic. They freaked Sensible. out. Demented. Demented. Full of hassles. Hassles. Moody. Temperament. 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 Enchanted, Enchanted in the mind. mind. And extremely, extremely stoned, stoned on the sun. Sun. They freaked out. You know? Black, Black priests, priests of the of Great, great society. society. This flagitious assault, assault on the libido. He realized that he also seems dangerous, which for a poet may be a contradiction in terms. One person who never dug their music said, like, you know, they'd be worthwhile if all they did was inspire all this writing. With the Doors, it was always, like, impressionistic. It was like, how they strike me in my universe. What have they done to the earth? What have they done to our fair sister? Ravaged and plundered and ripped her and bit her. Stuck her with knives in the side of the dawn and tied her with fences and dragged her down. I hear a very gentle sound. With your ear down to the ground We want the world and we want it We want the world and we want it Now Now
So when the music's over When the music's over yeah. When the music's over Turn out the lights Turn out the lights Turn out the lights What the music is your special Pop Chronicles continue in a moment. Nefarious pot and the various other hallucinogens had been a part of the Renaissance rock scene in Los Angeles almost from the very beginning. Derek Taylor. We have all smoked marijuana, either do or have done. Well, not exactly all. I'm really just a phony, but forgive me because I'm stoned. In fact, some of the most scathing commentary on the stoned out of the subculture came from the long-haired leader of a freaky-looking freaky-sounding L.A. band called the Mothers of Invention. Newsweek once described them as the most radical and entertaining rock group in the United States. They are missionaries with a message. First-line musicians using their gifts to reshape the minds of you, Teen America. It can happen here. There was, Newsweek concluded in June of 1968, method in the mother's madness in their obscene gestures and erotic shenanigans with dolls in their seemingly random wanderings about the stage and in the mumbles grunts oinks and electronic twitters that course through their satiric rock songs frank zappa once called it electronic social work and the reason we can get away with that stuff is because the guys really want to do it they're ready for anything if i tell them to go out uh, if a guy normally plays saxophone and I tell him to go up and sing unaccompanied, he'll do it. If I tell him to tap dance, he'll do it. You know, Not because I have complete control over them, but because they like the idea of what would happen if I tap dance, you know, or uh, took my pants off or anything. You know, we don't normally do that. <laughs> clean group, clean group. But we just like to get out there and, uh, you know, just see what's going to happen. Do it again, do it again. are too tight. Do you think that I'm creepy? Let me take a minute and tell you my plan. Let me take a minute and tell who I am. If it doesn't show, then you better know I'm another person. We are the other people. We are the other people. We are the other people. You're the other people too. On the way to get to you. Dream through. 
Despite the unfortunate fact that most radio stations in the U.S. refuse to air the mother's records... You guys should be ashamed of yourselves, pigs. The mothers packed them in for live performances from L.A. to New York to London. In 1968, several major magazines carried articles about Frank Zappa. And Jazz and Pop magazine named him Pop Musician of the Year in its annual poll. Ralph Gleason. I think Frank Zappa is a musical genius. And I think the music that the mothers play is music in a pure musical sense of the highest level. Now, it's an interesting comment on the American society that in order to put on a concert of absolutely beautifully pure music, they have to come out and make believe that it's comic, make believe that their whole thing is satirical. Now, they're very satirical in the way they look, the way they speak, and the way they act on the stage, but the music is as pure as the Philadelphia Symphony. <laughs> Some people felt that Frank Zappa, in addition to creating the best satire in pop music, was composing some of its best melodies. I hadn't noticed that. I think that the melodies are kind of nice sometimes, but nobody ever liked the melodies. Nobody ever came up to us and commented about our melodies. They always say, you guys sure do some funny stuff, and they talk about the funny words, but nobody ever say anything about our melodies or chord changes. Why, Why did you say something about it? What's your trip, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I got a sense of humor, and uh, I think that everybody should have a sense of humor. It doesn't have to be like mine. You can laugh at whatever you want to, but you got to laugh at something. You can't take it all seriously. If you do, you'll believe in the government and all those other things that are you know, that are really crazy. I'm going to tell you the way it is, and I'm not going to be kind or easy. Your moral attitude stinks, I say, and the life you lead is complete. So we'd like to have a, a good time with our tunes. We'll take them apart for you, you know, like we'll play a little melody, and right before your very eyes and teenage years, we'll dismantle it for you, show you where we put the glue, show you where the screws and the nails go, show you where the braces and the supports went to hold it out, you know, that little shiny part that we showed to you in the front. And we show you all the gruesome stuff on the inside, you know, it's like looking at the other side of the cave in a science fiction movie, you know where the giant spider is? You know that cave is phony, you know there's a bunch of boards on the other side of it with a guy with a t-shirt on leaning up against it eating a sandwich. <laughs> Like a spinning top, the Pachuco hop, and the LA slop. You make a streetcar stop at the soda shop, and my eyeballs pop when I see my jelly roll thumb drop. Got my eyes on you. His native musical environment was the rhythm and blues vocal group sound of the 50s, which the mothers later recaptured in albums like Freak Out and Cruising with Reuben and the Jets. Because I really love that kind of music, it drives me up the wall when I listen to it. He also became deeply involved in the music of contemporary classical composers like Igor Stravinsky and Edgar Varese. 
His formal musical education was limited to a harmony course in junior college in his hometown, Ontario, California. They showed you how to harmonize old-time music. It was very difficult for me to see how harmonizing a chorale would come in handy later on in my uh, teenage career. Amen. But his self-made musical brilliance was there for all to hear in a pair of albums recorded in 1967 and released in 68. First came, We're Only In It For The Money, complete with a jacket hilariously spoofing the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper. The whole al album was such an overall parody, you know. It was just uh, a reflection of what was going on at that time in our teenage history. Then came Lumpy Gravy, the critics didn't like it as much as its predecessor. Well, I think that uh, they should have been completely integrated. I would have liked to have intercut them, you know, like uh, if I had my chance to do it all over again, I would probably put that out as a two-record set and have the material more interspersed with orchestral interludes between the songs on <clears throat> We're Only In It For The Money. But I uh, just couldn't put it together that way. And it doesn't bother me if people don't like what we do. You know, I just feel sorry for them that they're not having as much fun as they ought to. <laughs> Thank you. 
side of the creek she knew They killed her too In a moment, a preview of the next chapter in John Gilliland's The Pop Chronicle. I did a lecture at USC about two months ago where the history professor that had invited me to the class had made the comment that it was his opinion that the history of this generation will not be left in books, it will be left in records. And uh, I think he's got it. I, the, the living history of this time is really in the grooves of what the kids bought and the things that they bought will influence the history. You know, it's an interesting cycle. The records that they listen to help make their attitudes and the attitudes after they're made from record A and then display themselves as social conduct will in turn influence the production of other records which will come back and influence another set of social standards and so on and so forth. I think it's a very important medium and I think it's at least as important as television to old people. Television is pretty detrimental to young people too but the uh, record industry is helping to counteract some of the bad effects of television. And the beat goes on. Yes, the beat goes on. And the beat goes on. Next on the Pop Chronicles, more of our exploration of the L.A. pop rock scene in the era of psychedelia. Here are a few of the numbers we'll be doing. Here we come. Worse than playing Superman. Really good. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to my bluebird laugh. She can't tell you why. First, it was a, a bunch of yakety throw up guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta remember that. Well, now. We're putting you upside down. That's it, just a taste. The trouble is, the audience is so narrow-minded about that, you know. If you don't play like they think every other rock and roll band should play, then you stink, and let's bring on the fudge, you know. Thanks, fudge. are written, narrated, and produced by John Gilliland. Associate producer, Chester Coleman. Guests on this program, in order of their appearance, were John Phillips, Danny Fields, Ray Manzarek, Bobby Krieger, Jim Morrison, John Densmore, Derek Taylor, Frank Zappa, and Ralph Gleason. Mr. Field and The Doors were interviewed by Mike Masterson. Your announcers, Tom Beck and Cy Holiday. Chronicles are intended solely for the private enjoyment of our audience. Any other use of the material without the express written consent of John Gilliland is prohibited. <laughs>